The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. How are you, friend? Thank you very much for checking in with us on another episode of the Paul Leslie Hour. If you're hearing this, God willing, I was at the Jimmy Buffett concert the other day. Most of you know that I began my broadcasting career on Jimmy Buffett's Radio Margaritaville. That was more than 15 years ago, going on 16 years ago. Through the years, I've had the chance to talk to a lot of people who are in some way connected to Jimmy Buffett. That brings us to this interview with Carol Shaughnessy. I recorded this interview down in Key West, Florida. Very interesting person. She is a writer and publicist. Her work has covered a lot of facets of the tourism and entertainment world. Carol Shaughnessy has spent almost her entire life in Key West, Florida. She speaks of Key West with a kind of warm reverence. Her life in the Keys has allowed her to meet many fascinating people, including the legendary Phil Clark, a man she loved and in his later years she was engaged to. Phil Clark was the subject of what is perhaps one of Jimmy Buffett's most loved classic songs, A Pirate Looks at Forty. Shaughnessy went on to work for Jimmy Buffett as the head of his mail-order business and as his fan relations person. She answered all the correspondence from the fans, and for the first three years of its existence, she was the editor of Jimmy Buffett's successful Coconut Telegraph publication, That was like a newsletter. It had news about Jimmy Buffett and all the things going on in the world of Margaritaville. And, of course, stuff you could buy like t-shirts. I think Carol Shaughnessy is someone who has chosen the adventurous route in life. She's done a lot of interesting things. She served as the former director of Key West's Hemingway Days festivals. She wrote and recorded the stories of so many fascinating residents of the Conk Republic. She's also a current publicist in Key West. I think this interview is really interesting, especially if you're a Buffett fan. She explains what she calls the Margaritaville mystique, as well as what the magic of Key West is. I think it's a truly beautiful story of someone who can say, I have found me a home. Enjoy the interview with Carol Shaughnessy, and let me know what you think. It's a great pleasure to be down here in Key West, Florida with Ms. Carol Shaughnessy. Thank you so much for making the time to do this. Welcome to the island. Great to be here. I wanted to start kind of from the beginning. Where are you from originally? I grew up right outside of Minneapolis. And when I was 19, I realized that I had been about as cold as I ever wanted to be in my life. And a friend of mine said, well, hey, let's go down to Key. It It was January. A friend of mine said, hey, let's go down to Key West for a couple of months. Um, we'll come back when it gets warm up here. And I thought, well, Key West, pretty sure that it's warm there. Pretty sure that it's somewhere in Florida. Okay. I was taking a semester off from school, so I said, yeah, what, what the hell? Let's do that. What did you think when you got down here? Well, the day I got down here, I flew into what was then a very much third world looking airport. I walked off the plane, took off my $20 Salvation Army fur jacket, um, saw my first palm trees, and um, stepped out of the airport, and the ocean was right across the street, and um, I discovered that the taxi cams were all pink, so I got into a pink taxi cab and was driven through these gorgeous streets filled with flowering bushes whose names I did not know and beautiful wood frame Victorian houses and we got to my friend's friend's house where we were going to stay and I knocked on the door my friend's name was John, by the way, that, that, that will help as we get through this story. Knocked on the door, and the smell of marijuana came to the door to greet me. I thought, okay, 
and following the smell of marijuana was a guy who looked like a dark-haired Willie Nelson. And in my perky 19-year-old naive Minnesota girl voice, I said, Hi, I'm Carol. I'm John's friend. Is he here yet? And the guy whose name I eventually learned was not Willie Nelson, but Wally, said, John, Gosh, I haven't heard from John in a couple of years. How's he doing? <laughs> and it being Key West in the late 1970s, uh, 10 minutes later, Wally had said basically any friend of John's was a friend of his, and his daughter was with her mother at the time, so I could stay in his daughter's room until we got things straightened out, and don't worry, everything would be fine. And two days later, I was walking along the ocean. John did not show up until two years later, by the way. And by that, he was really upset that I hadn't waited for him. I had another boyfriend at the time. But two days after I got to Key West, I was walking along the ocean all by myself. And I realized for the first time in my life, I was home. And somehow, 30 years have passed, and that feeling has not passed. That feeling has never changed. That's amazing. What did you think of the people when you came down here? I was in part absolutely thrilled to find people that were kind of laid back, hippie kind of people that I had always hoped existed somewhere but had not met in my little Minnesota suburb. I was half delighted and half wildly intimidated because I knew I had a lot of catching up to do. I see. So I tried to catch up as quickly as I could, by the way. Did you succeed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what did you do for a living coming down here? My first job was selling frozen yogurt from a little booth on a street corner for $100 a week. And it was before Key West had really become a tourist destination, although it was it was on the verge of it. And there weren't a lot of people buying frozen yogurt, but that was okay because I could people watch. It was the corner of Duval and Angeles Streets. And I got an apartment with Molly's girlfriend, and I paid $75 a month for my share. And even making $100 a week, I could save a little money, and I figured I was rich, and I was the luckiest girl in the universe. Very interesting. How do you think Key West has changed over the years? Key West has grown up, um, as I have, and we both had to. Um, the things that I fell in love with about Key West are still here. You know, I still ride my bike down a side street at dusk, and when you do that, you see the lights coming up in the houses, and and you can kind of wonder about the lives of the people behind those windows, and you smell flowers that only bloom at dusk, and it's all kind of overlaid with a, a scent of salt water, and somehow the idea that just as the sun goes down, something wonderful is going to happen around the next corner. That has not changed ever. Um, I still walk down the street and see half a dozen people, and they'll say, hey, Carol, how are you? What's going on? Or I'll say, hey, I haven't seen you since, you know, whatever. There's a very small town sensibility about Key West, even though it has become an international tourist destination, we're still a real small town. And like a small town, we know each other and we care about each other. And if somebody needs something, it is it, it is provided. You know, a lot of people here don't have health insurance, you know, working in a bar or whatever. Somebody's on a scooter, in a scooter accident or, or something, and 10 minutes later, 
There's a benefit organized, and the local musicians are all donating their talent to play, and the artists are giving some of their work for an auction. Um, this is one of the most giving communities I have ever encountered in my entire life, um, and that has not changed. There's something called the Key West Nod. Um, There's something called the Key West Nod, um, and it speaks volumes. You can walk down a street. You might be on your phone or holding a conversation with the person walking next to you, but at the same time, you spot somebody you know, and you give a little nod, and they will give a little nod back. And that is an entire conversation. It's like, well, hey, how are you? I haven't seen you since you know Fantasy Fest or whatever. Um, Everything okay? And the nodded response is basically, yeah, great to see you too. Doing fine. <laughs> and uh, there's just such a sense of community here. The population has, has virtually not changed since I got here. We're steady at about 25,000 people. And it, it, this island will just wrap its arms around you if you're supposed to be here. Some people can't feel that magic, and that's fine. Otherwise, the whole world would be living here. <laughs> um, but I can tell you story after story after story like mine. People came down on vacation, or they came down to work for a couple of months during high season, or there's, they docked here on their sailboat, and they never left. People just get captured by this community. Um, there's a legend that says if you get sand in your shoes while you're down here, you will return again and again and again. And in my, in my life now, I do a lot of work with travel writers and visitors because I, I'm a publicist for the Keys Tourism Council through an agency called Newman PR. And, you know, I'll tell a group of travel writers that little legend about sand in your shoes. And next beach, you're going to see them taking their shoes off and scuffing their, their feet in the sand because mm -hmm. they want to come back. Um, this community is, you know, there, there's so many communities that are, you know, you can say it's X environment, it's percent environment, it's X percent people, it's, it's X percent factory, it's X percent this industry, that. Key West is about 99 percent heart. And if you've got a good heart, this community embraces you. On the other hand, if you are pretentious and coming in trying to uh, la di dot over everybody else, it's going to spit you out so fast you won't know what happened. And that's as it should be. Yeah. So kind of getting back to the the uh, the plot of your story, when uh, when you first got established here, where did you, what did you say or think to think like, okay, where am I going to go from here? I know I'm not leaving, but I had always been a writer, um, or I let's say I had always written, and I figured with Key West's very strong literary heritage and that somehow I would write. And there's, it, Key West will, <laughs> this sounds crazy, but if this is the kind of place where you feel free to figure out who you want to be and then perhaps because it's a small community, perhaps because it's an accepting community, perhaps because it takes you at face value, you you are not afraid to take the steps to become that person. And so I went from a, a teenager who wrote poetry to a, a feature writer for local magazines and newspapers and then got into PR. And for the last 10 years, I have been a, a publicist as I said, for the Tourism Council. Um, along the way, 
I worked for Jimmy Buffett. Um, he was, I met him because I, my first Key West fiance, I told you I did a lot of catching up. My first Key West fiance was a man named Phil Clark. And although I did not know it at the time, he was the man that Buffett had written A Pirate Looks at 40 about, the song that begins Mother, Mother Ocean. Well, I had fallen in love with the song about a year before I ever met the man. And I fell in love with the man before I knew that the song had been written about him. Um, but he was the quintessential uh, renegade captain um, with the shady side who was a, a tremendous gentleman, a courtly gentleman with a rounder's eye. And uh, I think a lot of my love of Key West came through listening to him and listening to his friends. It's like you know, they knew that I wanted to write, and I think in a sense they realized that their um, kind of hobbyist, smuggler, renegade days were coming to an end. And so it's almost like they wanted someone to remember. And so they told me their stories. And poured their memories into me. And uh, almost as an extension of that, I met Buffett, who was a dear friend of Phil's, and Phil went the way of the, the character in the song, Pirate Looks at 40, and uh, shortly after that, uh, Jimmy came to me and said, hey, you're the only person I know who knows how to use a computer. Um, I'm working on some short stories and a play, I mean a, a screenplay, and I need somebody to put it on computer. Will you, will you help me? So he was writing the short stories that, that ultimately, some of them very much changed, became Tales from Margaritaville. And he was also writing the Margaritaville movie, which never saw the screen, but damn it, it should have. It's just a stunning piece of work. And he felt like when Club Paradise came out, he felt like it had it, that there were too many similarities and that he would be thought to have tried to capitalize on Club Paradise's success, although he had started his screenplay far before Club Paradise came out. But so I worked on that for about three months with him. And then he and Sunshine Smith asked to have a meeting with me, and uh, essentially Jimmy said, hey, we're starting a store. We're going to start a mail order business. It's going to be the Margaritaville store, and I've got this idea for a you know, newsletter, mail order, catalog kind of thing called the Coconut Telegraph, and by that time I had been doing some writing for local magazines, and, and he had a certain comfort level with my ability to actually write rather than just use a computer. And he said, so, will you run my mail order business and, and write the Coconut Telegraph? I had no idea what I was getting into. I mean, I don't think Jimmy had any idea what he was getting into. I said, yeah, sure, whatever. Sounds cool. And I wrote the first three years of the Coconut Telegraph. Um, and uh, Fingers Taylor was an on-the-road correspondent for me. And he, he was an old friend also. Um, oh gosh, we covered tours, we covered uh, the opening of Margaritaville, um, we were a front and back, black and white, one page, little newsletter at first, and I remember the first mailing that we did was 600 copies to some kind of scruffy little mailing list Jimmy had accumulated. And the Margaritaville store, of course, didn't have any money to pay for an actual mailing house or anything. So we gathered up all the kids of the people who worked at the store. And I was living in a place that had a big loft area. And we all went up to the loft. And I, made a, I paid them a dollar an hour to put stickers, up, fold and put stickers on the first coconut telegraph so we could make that first mailing. And um, 
one of one of the coolest things that ever happened in my life and now I can't even remember what the what the nighttime show was but when Last Mango in Paris came out uh, the Coconut Telegraph was on I believe it was Letterman Letterman talked about the Coconut Telegraph wow. and what Jimmy was doing and he held up a Coconut Telegraph on the screen and I was going that's my Coconut Telegraph oh my gosh I can't believe it that's my Coconut Telegraph on oh, Dave so I, I probably was Dave but I can't get to it but yeah it was cool wow. it was really cool I was hoping, just kind of rewinding here just a bit, I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about Phil Clark, just as far as the song, I'm sure, is it is it mostly myth, or how much of it is true? Too much. Too much true. Too much is true. It, it's, it is pretty much all true, down to, um, down to the fact that Phil did drown. Jimmy wrote it years before. It was as much an autobiography. It was as much a biography as Jimmy has ever written. It was. It captured Phil perfectly. Um, I was definitely one of those younger women. Hmm. Um, he had done a bit of smuggling. Uh, he did like his cocktails, and uh, and yet in. In the same way, one of the genius parts of Jimmy's writing is that while he was portraying this this out of the box renegade, he also captured his gentlemanliness, his innate honor and integrity. And uh, the song is dead true, absolutely true. Wow. Phil was a good man. Phil had a, a sense of integrity that. Even in Key West, you don't often find nowadays. He was he was a good man. What about Jimmy Buffett? When you first met him, what was your impression of him? He scared the hell out of me. I was so intimidated by him. Um, he was the most creative person that I had ever met. Um, he had a short attention span. But I, I kind of think you can't not when you have so much so many ideas, so many projects, um, so much life going on in your mind. Um, and he was a terrifically good-hearted man. He, I remember once when he and Savannah were writing, had, had just finished Jolly Mon. I did a lot of the fan, forgive me for jumping around, I did a lot of the fan relations, answered a lot of the fan mail. Um, and, and was kind of the public face of Margaritaville via the mail. And I remember we got a letter from a woman whose daughter had been in a car accident and, and was in, had been in a coma for over a month. And she wrote that she had continued to play Jimmy's music for the little girl because the little girl loved Jimmy's music and after a month went by she woke up and the prognosis was very good and the woman the mother wanted to thank Jimmy for having written music that helped bring her daughter back to life and Jimmy had the galley proofs of Jolly Mon on his desk at the at the time he had an office in the Margaritaville warehouse and that's where we all had our offices too. And he had the, the galleys of Jolly Mon. And he called in the changes that he wanted made to the publisher. And he had me wrap up those galleys and send them to the little girl after he wrote a note on them. I've never forgotten that. That was that was Jimmy. And I made some tremendous good friends through Buffett fans. I still have, I am the um, aunt to a little girl born to a Buffett fan that started writing to me when she was 13 years old. And uh, her name is, is Celeste McWilliams. She's married now and lives in 
on Manlum, Florida, and I'm her little girl's aunt. She and her husband got married down here because I had become her big sister by that time. And uh, friendships like that came to me through working at Margaritaville and, and through the world that Jimmy created in his music. We, we said often that we weren't selling t-shirts and in a way Jimmy wasn't even selling music, but we were selling the Margaritaville mystique. And uh, the Coconut Telegraph did a lot of exploring of what is the Margaritaville mystique, what, what is it that is so appealing, that is so enticing to people that they want to live the life that they hear about in the music. And if they can't forever, then they can for the spell of a concert or the length of a CD or whenever they put on their Margaritaville t-shirt. And it was that Margaritaville mystique that Jimmy created in some way was an extension of the passion for Key West that Phil and his friends had instilled in me. And that has, for me, that has gone on to infuse the work that I do with travel writers, with travel media. Um, I came into public relations as a writer, not as a, a trained, you know, college publicist. And so when I'm meeting with travel writers or film crews, it's I'm showing off my home, you know, showing them what I love. And that what Phil left me with, what working for Jimmy left me with, what my own writing and my own exploration and my own experiences in Key West taught me are all distilled into that and have all helped shape that. And it's, it's, I had no idea this was how I would end up. I felt that there was nothing better than being a Key West Island girl. And I had no idea that there was a career that would allow me to do that well into my just about as old as Jimmy years. No, not quite. No, he's a little older than I am. But I'm 52 and I'm still a Key West Island girl. <laughs> and uh, how, how precious is that? really is a beautiful story. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about the public uh, relations thing that you've been doing. Well, I work with a company called Newman PR, and they are based in Miami, but their heart is in the Keys. Um, they're the public relations and media relations firm for the Monroe County Tourist Development Agency, and they have been the TDC's PR agency for more than 25 years. And Andy Newman is the primary keys person uh, for the agency. And I have to tell you, the keys are not a client for Andy. The keys are a crusade. And that fits in just absolutely perfectly with my mindset because um, we we get to share the place that we love with the world. Um, we publicize special events in Key West and the Keys. We publicize um, water sports and diving and Fantasy Fest and the Parrot Heads coming down and the Pigeon Key Art Festival and the powerboat races and um, the wonderful work that's being done at the Turtle Hospital. Um, the, the personalities that make up the keys, the incredible environmental efforts that are going on here, um, the fact that John Pennycamp Coral Reef State Park in Key Largo was America's first underwater park. How amazing is that? Um, we've got a hundred, a hundred year old history of conserving 
We've got a 100-year-old history of conserving the Keys natural resources. The Key West National Wildlife Refuge celebrates its 100th anniversary this month, November. And, and I get to tell people about that. We, as Newman PR, get to tell people about that. And um, when you love what you do, it doesn't get any better than that. That's that in very in in a great sense is the lifestyle Jimmy espouses. Do what you love, love what you do. You get to grow older, but not up. Yeah. You used the word mystique earlier, and that's the one thing about this island. There are a lot of people that uh, they have a mystique to them, like Captain Tony, who just passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, I did an interview with him, and when he walked in the room. It was like there was an aura, almost. And there's a lot of people down here that are, are like that. It's like they're magic, almost. But uh, another person that uh, is no longer with the world but made a huge mark on literature is Ernest Hemingway, who loved this, this place also. And you're kind of keeping that spirit alive. And so I was hoping you could tell us about that. It's... Um, this competition and its listeners out there can visit shortstorycompetition.com. Mm -hmm. But I was hoping you could tell us about it. For years, pro gosh, probably about 20 years now, I've been involved with the Hemingway Days Festival, which was started by a gentleman named Michael Walton. Um, and one of its components was a short story competition directed by Ernest Hemingway's granddaughter, Lorian. And Lorianne Hemingway is an incredibly fine writer. Um, she is every bit the writer that Ernest was, although she has not received such recognition. She is the author of three books, um, one, one fiction book and two nonfiction pieces. And she's currently working on a book length biography or exploration of Key West. And for more than 25 years, she has directed the short story competition because as great as her passion for her own work is her passion to support and provide recognition for emerging writers. And for the last, gosh, 11 or 12 years, I've been her partner in the short story competition. And uh, we award $2,000 each year to writers whose work is just at that cost, you know, to people whose voices should be heard but have not yet gotten the recognition that they deserve, the credit that they deserve. And the competition has become internationally respected. We've gotten, this past year we got over 1,100 entries from, I would say, besides the U.S., probably 25 different countries. And uh, we are uh, we are committed to supporting those writers whose voices should be heard. And if, if you are a writer who has had significant success in fiction, we're sorry, but you're not eligible because we provide and we want to provide some of that first recognition. And we've been told that that for a writer to win or place second or third, that their worth goes up significantly when they're submitting something for an anthology or trying to get an agent or something like that because the competition, because of Lorian's literary integrity, is very well known and very highly respected. So we, are, we accept stories all year. People can go to shortstorycompetition.com and uh, get the current writer's guidelines. They can see some previous stories that have won or that Lorian has felt very strongly about. Um, and we, we try to put updates on the site regularly. We try to put updates on the site regularly, although I must confess that we're a little behind right now. But we want people who believe in their work whose voices need to be heard to submit stories. We, we will provide everything we can 
to give them the credit for their talent that they deserve. Very good. And there's another website. I'm sure most of my listeners have either been to Key West. I'm sure that uh, a lot of them maybe have dreamed about it. But uh, it's kind of like a portal to the Keys. Yes. And it's a very good resource. I was hoping you could tell us about that. The Tourism Council's website is fla-keys.com. And it started out as a website about all of the five districts of the Keys. Key Largo, Isla Mirada, Marathon in the Middle Keys, Big Pine in the Lower Keys, and Key West. Because each one of those districts has uh, something unique to offer, and it's a 120-mile island chain. So, so some of the offerings are very different than the other areas of the Keys offerings. Well, somewhere around 1,600 pages into it, we realized this is not a this is a portal. It has accommodations information and click-throughs to most of the accommodations in the Keys. It has water sports, diving, snorkeling, attractions information, um, uh, special events, calendar, and links to all the websites. We're soon to be putting up a section on remarkable characters in the Keys called Keys Voices. And uh, so people who are planning their trip, who are armchair travelers dreaming about coming down here, or who want to kind of relive their trip, FLA-keys.com. Very good. Just a couple more questions. Uh, my friend Wesley and I here have been eating some great food. Every time I come down here, there's I try something new, and I was hoping you could tell us, because you live down here, what's your favorite restaurant down here, and what do you get when you go there? Oh, wow, that is so hard. <laughs> um, I can give you a handful. I can't give you one. Mangoes on Duval Street is um, is a gourmet restaurant, although a very low-key, comfortable gourmet restaurant. Um, their chef was the first QS chef invited to showcase his cuisine at the James Beard Foundation. They make an appetizer that is beyond anything. I believe it's the world's most perfect appetizer. It's called a mushroom martini. Order a mushroom martini. Trust me on this one. Hmm. Um, go to the Half Shell Raw Bar. They are right down on the waterfront in Key West Historic Seaport. They make a fresh tuna salad with fresh caught Keys tuna. It's absolutely stunning. Um, this place called the Hogfish out on Stock Island. And it's a funky, laid back, working marina bar and restaurant. And they almost always have hogfish, which is a light, white fish. And I don't believe they can do anything to screw up the taste of hogfish at the hogfish. You, you cannot order a hogfish dish there and not just absolutely feel like it's the best thing you've ever had. Um, wow. The turtle crawls down by the historic seaport is undergoing renovation now. They may be, re they may have been reopened. Love the turtle crawls. They have the best smoked fish dip. And I have on occasion gone up and down the keys tasting smoked fish dip. It's one of my things, but order their smoked fish dip. Um, up the keys in Marathon, there's a place called Keys Fisheries. And Keys Fisheries is, again, just a little waterfront funky place um, where the stone crab fishermen tie up. But they have something called a lobster Reuben. Imagine the traditional Reuben sandwich without sauerkraut and lobster instead of meat. <laughs> you got to try good. it. You got to try it. Um, breakfast, Blue Heaven. Um, Blue Heaven has, you know, most people go to Blue Heaven for the homemade pancakes or the homemade banana bread. Blue Heaven also has amazing bacon, and they make a special omelet and a special um, Benedict every day with whatever is, is the freshest seafood. So you can get a lobster omelet and a lobster Benedict at Blue Heaven. And that is on the site of a former boxing ring where Ernest Hemingway used to referee boxing matches. 
So there's a lot of good food in this town. This is true. Well, I have one final question. This broadcast, thanks to the power of technology, is going out all over the world. So what would you like to say to the world? What would you like to say to all those people that are listening in? For those of you with open hearts looking for a place that will provide a welcome warmer than you would ever imagine, come to Key West. It doesn't get better than this. That's true. I, I very much appreciate this interview. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. See what I mean? You can't shut me up. <laughs> you get me started and you can't shut me up. I thought it was a great interview. Thank you very much. Goodbye.